Hey folks, Roland Martin here broadcasting live from Los Angeles where we are here covering the 50th NAACP Image Awards uh, taking place on Saturday. But on today's Roland Martin Unfiltered for Thursday, March 28th, 2019, more drama out of Chicago dealing with Justice Follett. Donald Trump orders the FBI to investigate what took place, the plea deal there. Also, the continuing whining and crying of Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel who wants Jesse Smollett to pay back the city, um, did he somehow forget the millions of dollars that Chicago has had to pay out in police brutality cases? Also, what the hell's up with the District Attorney's Asso National Association calling out Cook County DA Kim Fox, but not other district attorneys on police shootings? Oh yeah, I got something to say about that. HUD sues Facebook over discrimination in housing. And my panel and I take on Facebook's decision to ban white nationalists and white separatist posts. Will it work and does it go far enough? Trump, under media and activist pressure, reinstates funding in his budget for the Special Olympics and allows Liberian refugees to stay another year in the United States. Another African-American joins the race for the White House. The mayor of Miramar, Florida, Population 140,000, we've got his announcement video, and that is, we'll tell you who Wayne Messam is, because many of you probably have never heard of him. Also, we'll update you on the state of play on the GOP power grab in Wisconsin, and a federal judge strikes down work requirements for Medicaid in Arkansas and Kentucky, and some more crazy as white folks lose their mind, this time, a TV news team and two Republican congressmen. Well, I'm gonna really deal with the Republican congressman. It's time to bring the funk on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. All right, folks, everybody's getting in on the Justice Smollett drama coming out of Chicago. Today, Donald Trump, uh, who hated his own FBI and Justice Department uh, just a few weeks ago for investigating him, tweeted this today. FBI and DOJ to review outrageous Justice Smollett case in Chicago it is an embarrassment to our nation. Really? An embarrassment to our nation. The very man who constantly lies left and right. He's calling somebody else an embarrassment to our nation. Gotcha. Also, folks, there's more to the Smollett story today uh, than, of course, uh, what Donald Trump is talking about. Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, this is what he had to say. He's got, he, I mean, he's running his mouth left and right. Y'all, check this out. Police are assembling the cost. Uh, they'll do that. And uh, then the Corporation Council of the City of Chicago will communicate to, uh, to Jesse Smollett and his legal team about recouping that cost uh, in that effort. And uh, given that he doesn't feel any sense of contrition, and remorse, my recommendation is when he writes the check, in the memo section, he can put the word, I'm accountable. For the well, guess what, Smollett's defense clapped back, quote, it is the mayor and the police chief who owe Jesse, owe him an apology for dragging an innocent man's character through the mud. Jesse has paid enough. Now, here's what's interesting. Rahm Emanuel wants this all over. First of all, have y'all noticed how talkative Rahm Emanuel is? When is the last time you actually heard this much from Rahm Emanuel on any other case in Chicago? How about this, Rahm? Let's hear you talk about Chicago, since we want to add up the cost. Let's talk about Chicago last year spending nearly $50 million to settle police abuse cases. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. Did I actually say that? Yes. He's crying about the cost involving the Justice Millet case. But again, last year, $50 million spent by the city of Chicago to settle police brutality cases. Or oh, I guess he forgot about that. 
Uh, now, I'm also going to pull up another number uh, that shows you the millions of dollars that have actually uh, been spent uh, as well in Chicago. Okay, again, 50 million last year. We're also talking about uh, over the course of a decade, check this out, between 2004 and 2016, police misconduct cases cost the city of Chicago. Y'all ready for this? Get yourself together. $662 million. Let me repeat that. In a 12-year period, the city of Chicago spent $662 million settling police misconduct cases. I do not recall a single speech by Rahm Emanuel slamming police officers for costing the city, the citizens of Chicago, the taxpayers of Chicago, 662, matter of fact, 662 plus the 50, we now, folks, are at 700 plus million dollars. Please show me the video of Rahm Emanuel complaining about spending $700 million of taxpayer money because of rogue cops. Yeah, I thought so. Now, check this out, folks. The National District Attorneys Association, also known as NDAA, issued this rebuke of Cook County DA Kim Fox on how she and her office handled the case. Now, check this out. Quote, the case in Chicago illustrates a point that must be discussed in an effort to ensure fairness in our criminal justice system. The rich are treated differently. The politically connected receive favorable treatment. And Lady Justice sometimes peeks under her blindfold to see who stands before her. NDAA rejects these inequities as they are antithetical to our founding principles of justice that no one is above the law. Can y'all please tell me, first of all, have you ever heard of the National District Attorneys Association? Two, when is the last time you've ever heard them talk about police brutality? When is the last time you've ever had them issue a press release on DAs who do not prosecute cops for doing wrong? We just had the case in Pittsburgh. Cop went on trial, homicide, found not guilty. We had, of course, Stephon Clark in Sacramento. That case. I can go down the line, case after case. In fact, explain, did y'all ever hear a statement from the National District Attorney Association condemning Anita Alvarez for improperly charging Dante Servin, the cop who jumped into a conversation, pulled his gun out, shot and killed Rakia Boy, in, shot her in the head, she dies, Anita Alvarez charges him wrongly, his case gets thrown out, the judge says, oh, this is the wrong charge, Dante Servin walked free. Please, y'all, take your time showing me where, where those district attorneys issued a press release condemning Anita Alvarez. I'll wait. Yeah, you can't find it. You can't. Now check this out. Now we got this idiot Illinois State Rep Michael McCullough who says he's introducing a bill to kill tax credits to productions that hire Justice Smollett. Now it's very interesting. Yesterday on social media, uh, my girl Lovey took uh, umbrage to me saying that white folks are treating Justice Smollett like he's OJ, like this is OJ 2.0. She said, Roland, that's unfair. Well, what do you now say, lovey? What do you now say to the rest of the people out there who say that I was wrong for comparing to OJ? The point I'm making is the white reaction to the Smollett case is also how white folks responded to OJ Simpson. Let's break all this stuff down with our pal, Dr. Greg Carr, Chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University, Long Victoria Burke, a writer with the NNPA, also Robert Patillo, civil rights attorney. Robert, I want to start with you. I, first of all, I ain't never heard of the National, <laughs> National District Attorneys Association. But for them to issue a statement condemning Kim Fox, when I don't recall them saying jack about other DAs and their wrongdoing, shows to me these white folks have lost their... Justice Smollett has literally caused white folks to lose their mind. Well, I, I think bigger than that, what the DA Association have to, has to be honest about is it's just a diversion program. 
All he did was the same diversion program that they offered Robert Kraft in Florida last week. Robert Kraft was offered the opportunity to have the charges against him for uh, soliciting prostitutes on multiple occasions dropped in exchange for doing community service and paying a fine. That's exactly what Jesse Smollett just did. He did community service at the Rainbow Post Coalition. He paid a fine. There's nothing outside of the ordinary about this. There's nothing that should be all this hyperbolic rhetoric, rhetoric all this discussion about Kim Fox everything else because people do not like the the nuts and bolts of the criminal justice system it is a class four felony which is a glorified misdemeanor to make a false police report. The same way the barbecue Becky and that all these other people who make false reports against African Americans don't get charged with felonies, they realize that Justice Smollett was overcharged by giving him 16 felony counts for making a false police report, and they gave him a diversion program which is within the guidelines of protocol in Cook County. I went to law school in Chicago. I clerked to the, um, at the Cook County uh, Courthouse. They have bigger issues to handle there. They have vice lords. They have Latin kings. They have a lot bigger things to deal with than somebody making a false police report, and that's why they gave him a diversion program. Now, the Smollett people need to shut the hell up. You got your deal. Go home. Sit down. Quit re releasing press statements. Stop doing press conferences. Get in the car. Take your winnings and go home. But at the same time, Rahm Emanuel, the police superintendent, all these people criticizing the diversion program need to just understand that this is par for the course for what you get for a class four felony slash glorified misdemeanor. Uh, Greg, I want to go to you again. The issue that I have here is you see this, these district attorneys who said nothing. In fact, I believe we reached out to them to get them on the show. Uh, and of course, they chicken out, uh, my, my understanding, and they would not come on the show. That shows me how weak they are. But, but Greg, to sit here and listen to Rahm Emanuel at that news conference two days ago, yesterday on Good Morning America, the whining today, $712 million spent over the last 14 years, and he is bitching and moaning about what the Justice Smollett uh, case cost the city of Chicago? Sit your ass down, Rahm Emanuel. I think that's probably all that needs to be said, Roland. I mean, our blood pressure goes up when we listen to these white supremacists, but uh, Rahm Emanuel is ostensibly a Democrat. Donald Trump is ostensibly a Republican. And yet, somehow, they both seem to be on the same side of this Justice Smollett issue because race trumps all those artificial political categories. The Chicago Police Union, this made-up group of DAs. Let's be clear, as Robert said, I mean, alternative dispute resolution is, is a normal thing. They're angry because Justice Smollett got treated, in their mind, like a white man. Like Robert Kraft. And like Robert Kraft, who was caught at the place. So let's be very clear about this. This isn't an issue of fact in Robert Kraft's case, but this billionaire gets the walk. So for Justice Smollett to avail himself of the same thing that white people do every day, they're going crazy, and they should go crazy, because guess what? This is why you register to vote, this is why you go out and vote. What you gonna do to Kim Fox? Put her back in office, stuff it down their throat. Finally, in terms of our sister Lovey, this is why we have to have journalists like you and a free black press, independent black press, do this analysis, because folks sitting around here on social media who don't understand the long arm and the warp and woof of this do not remember that when O.J. Simpson, guilty or not guilty, got treated like a rich white man who could pay for a defense and go into a court of law and have a fighting chance at something, uh, white people also lost their minds. So not only is your comparison apt and fit, anyone with a historical memory would not have disagreed with it. And, and, and Lauren, again, I, I'm looking at all these conservatives acting a fool on social media. I mean, you had uh, that wimp Charlie Kirk imploring Donald Trump uh, to bring in the FBI. I mean, you have Donald Trump now on social media saying the FBI, they're going to investigate what happened here. I'm looking at Rahm Emanuel. I'm looking at all these people. And I'm sitting there going, y'all are spending this much time on this when I do not recall, I do not recall ever seeing Rahm Emanuel go before the cameras on Good Morning America, on a CBS morning show, on news conference in Chicago, and looking in the camera and saying, all of you rogue damn cops with the Chicago police, y'all are costing taxpayers money because of your actions. And you talk, and again, I'm not, let me be real clear. 
Lauren, before I let you speak, I'm not making excuses for Jesse Smollett. Okay? The DA says she believes Jesse Smollett lied. They believe Smollett is guilty. Now, first of all, they keep saying, well, he was exonerated. He, I, I don't know what's going on. But the bottom line is, see, I'm talking about the reaction. I'm talking about how all of a sudden, out of all of these cases we see come out of Chicago, that Jesse Smollett is now the, the poster child for what's wrong with the criminal justice system. And, of course, the irony, of course, is that the president who's complaining about this just got off, so we think. We haven't seen the full Mueller report, but he just got off on, on what is effectively treason. Um, I think part of, you know, what Robert said about Smollett's people need to shut up, th that's right. I mean, they really, really need to shut up. Because the more they talk, the more they sort of drive the narrative. But, of course, what's going on with Donald Trump is what always goes on with Donald Trump. He cannot stand watching someone African-American making a decision and being in power. And so Kim Fox making that decision and being in power drives him crazy, and he's trying to undo it. It's kind of similar to what we saw with Marilyn Mosby in, in Baltimore and Stephanie Morales in, in Portsmouth. She had prosecuted a, a cop. It's like when you see African Americans in power making decisions, there's a certain constituency out there that cannot handle it. Compounding that is the fact that the police chief, you know, and, and now, of course, the mayor is joining him, got out there and ran his mouth with that big-time narrative about how Jesse Smollett embarrassed the city, which, by the way, nobody was really thinking about that. He just happened to sort of, I think, be in Chicago. But he made that huge narrative, and now you got to walk it back because you, you look ridiculous prosecuting somebody for something, though very stupid, that should have never happened and was just dumb, uh, beyond dumb, is not exactly, you know, as Robert pointed out, the most serious thing happening in the city of Chicago. Well, and I have to agree with Robert uh, on this one here. Jesse's, Jesse and your team, shut up. <laughs> yeah, right, shut up. I mean, they just shut keep up. talking. They can't. I mean, it's like they all can. this, no, they owe us an apology. <laughs> <laughs> they they do. can't. They can't, they can't roll them because what we're facing. I'm saying. With, it's celebrity culture now. We're faced with a culture that was never a culture to begin with. But in this moment, there is no consensus. There is no commonality. All there is is platform and brand. And Jesse, right. uh, you know, Jesse Smollett is fighting for his brand right. at this point. Right, they're branding. But, but the, the, on that issue of him fighting for his brand at this moment, the worst thing that he can do is keep making statements. Yeah. Because what, what right. will end up happening is those Nigerian brothers right. will sit down with Oprah. Right. Or, <laughs> I, I, I mean, for real. Good those, going. Those Nigerian brothers sit down with Oprah and well, break down on, things and bring out text uh, messages hold, hold and on emails. Hold on. Hold on. Right. It's hold over. On. Right, right. Oh. Well, that's why I tried to hold seal on. everything. I, 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 <laughs> Hold on, I, I keep getting criticized. People are like, don't refer to them as the Nigerian brothers, the Americans. Okay, the the American Nigerian brothers. <laughs> I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. Oh, ho, ho. all right, Robert. No, Robert. but it's just, Look, I, I, I just, I, I just, I will tell again, you I, I am just, it, I, I just think, I just, again, though, bottom line is this here. Now, here's the other piece, though. And this is why I would also tell justice people to chill out. The FBI is still investigating right. that right. letter that was sent to Jesse. Right. Now, here's the problem here, okay? According to the police, they found similar lettering or the magazine or the cutouts in the brother's apartment. Now, I don't know what, what's going on there. All I'm simply saying is, until that is dismissed or is gone, I'm like, look, you're not going to be prosecuted. It's, it's been expunged. The whole deal is sealed. I'm saying, go back to work. Go make music. No need to sit here and keep fanning the flames because what it does is it keeps people talking about this as opposed to moving on. So uh, that's right. the piece there. All right, y'all. I know y'all got something to say about this from here. Looks like Ben Carson might actually be doing something uh, for black people uh, there as Secretary of HUD. The department he has, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, they are suing Facebook for violating the Fair Housing Act by encouraging, enabling, and causing housing discrimination through its advertising platform. This is what Carson said, quote, Facebook is discriminating against people based upon who they are and where they live. Using a computer to limit a person's housing choices can be just as discriminatory as slamming a door in someone's face. Now, earlier this week, we told you that Facebook announced they would no longer allow advertisers to use data to discriminate in ads for housing. Civil rights groups have been pushing hard for them to do this. Also, 
Facebook announced uh, they also are dealing with this whole issue of hate crimes and not allowing people to post comments dealing with white supremacists uh, and targeting that. Civil rights groups have been supporting that as well. Let's, uh, let's go to my panel here on this. Uh, Greg, I want to go to you first. Um, first, it's like, well, first of all, uh, uh, as I think about what Ben Carson has done, I have to, since I'm here in L.A., uh, and this is where La La Land is, I have to think about the soldier story. My man Adolf Caesar. Oh my God, the dead has arisen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wondering who's script- from the color purple. Well, right, the color purple. That's right. That's right. Color purple. That's right. Yeah, because in uh, in a soldier story, his line was uh, CJ. The black race don't need you no more. And so that's why yeah. he can say that clearly to uh, to Ben Carson. Sometimes I'm sure Carson is following the script. Just like Betsy Idiot DeVos got blindsided when she didn't realize they had X'd out uh, special, um, the Special Olympics the other day. I don't know what Ben Carson is reading from, but I suspect that the motive behind his statement has more to do with them attacking Facebook than anything else. As far as this uh, Facebook banning hate speech or banning white nationalism, I was concerned having read their statement. They said that there were broader types of nationalism that were okay, like American pride, and Bosque separatism. And I thought, why would they single out Bosque separatism? And I'm thinking to myself about some of the more rabid pro-Israel lobbies, and I'm thinking, are they trying to carve out exceptions? But my concern is how they will orbit what speech they will suppress and what speech they will allow. Because the next thing you know, they may turn on the, the nation of Islam. They may come, and at that point, Us saying, well, get rid of the Klan, get rid of hate speech and white nationalism and white uh, separatism, which everybody can agree on, we might then be more concerned. This First Amendment issue isn't as brightly cut as some people might see. So I don't know if this is a victory as much as it is something that could erode freedom of speech. Lauren, the housing issue is critically important because, again, uh, look, the power of Facebook uh, is immense when you talk about digital ads. Uh, and for to, to allow folks to essentially discriminate uh, using that platform is dead wrong. And so uh, it's 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 good to see HUD having some type of activism and waking the hell up because they've been asleep at the wheel for the last two years. Yeah, but it's always political in the same way that they hate PBS, anything that they deem left leaning. Uh, you know, the Trump administration, of course, has this, uh, as Greg just said, has this obsession with Facebook with regard to what they view as blocking speech from the right. And so that's really what's going to be behind this. And, you know, as it goes forward, I think that they'll fully reveal that that's what's behind. Now, now, now Carson may, in fact, blunder and do something right for once uh, in the time that he's been in there. But I suspect what they'll do is they'll start they'll start really going after Facebook uh, very singularly and specifically in the same way they go after, uh, you know, PBS. um, And it won't really reveal anything or fix anything and just will poke Facebook for a political reason. Robert? I told y'all to trust Ben Carson. I've been saying this for (laughs) years. Ben Carson had our back the whole time. Ben Carson didn't just go from being the National Black History Museum to being this uh, sellout Uncle Tom as he's been cast in the media in three years. Ben Carson been there for us. He's been fighting for us this entire time. He's been fighting to reform housing and urban development. On the point that Greg was making about the uh, social media and and white nationalist language, let's be very careful about that. Because if today they're banning David Duke, Tomorrow it'll be the Farrakhan, the day after it'll be Garvey, the after right. that it'll be Malcolm X, right. then it'll be Dr. King. So let's not take these uh, these encroachments on uh, freedom of speech light, lightly because where, if it starts over there, uh, all of a sudden white people found this new word reverse racism that they like to use all the time. Right. And they like to use that indiscriminately. So they will use that against us uh, very soon. Robert. Robert, what the hell has Ben Carson been doing for us as HUD secretary? What, what Ben Carson has been doing as HUD secretary, I'm glad you asked that because I did two hours of research in the car. Uh, the, what Ben Carson has been doing is reforming a broken, ha- broken housing and urban development department that has been broken for 30 years. How? Reforming programs, taking money out of certain areas, refocusing it on having mixed-use development. So instead of having giant housing projects in the middle of the city, there are urban slums. He's been working on creating funding mechanisms Robert, Robert, use environments. Robert, yeah, go ahead. Robert, let me, Robert, let me, let me help you out. To it, no, 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 Robert, let me help you out. Because see, unfortunately, for the argument you just made, you're talking to somebody whose expertise has been covering housing. 
I was I covered housing as a county government reporter for the Austin American Statesman. Housing was under my purview, and I was a reporter for the for the uh, Fort Worth Star Telegram, and I was a city hall reporter. The mixed use development that stuff started first of all under Jack Kemp. Then when Henry Cisneros became head of HUD, this has been going on since the '90s. When I spent six years in Chicago, uh, executive editor of the Chicago Defender, 2004 to 2007, I left Chicago in 2010. The Chicago Housing uh, Department, they actually tore down those high rises there and guess what they went to? Mixed use. I actually covered uh, those cover stories in the Chicago Defender. This ain't Ben Carson all of a sudden doing this, okay? This has been literally going, this has been the HUD official policy for about 25 years. Now, we're also dealing with the reality that with HUD, this is the, this is, this is the same Ben Carson who told cities that they did not have to submit their plans as to how they were going to eradicate discrimination in housing. The cities complained saying, oh, this was too onerous, and he said, okay, that's fine, it's no problem. So explain to me, how was that good for black folks? By reducing regulations, by reducing red tape, by getting projects moving instead of having 50 pages of documents that have to be submitted before you can break no, down you just missed, no, no, you, you just No, 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 you just missed that. You just missed what I said. Literally, allow cities not to have to submit their plans to show how they were going to end housing discrimination in their cities. The, he overturned the rules of the Obama administration. That's what he did in the first year as her secretary. Because the rules under the Obama administration weren't working. Let's think back four years, think back eight years. It's not like everybody in the hood was living in a land of milk and honey and then Ben Carson came no, in and no, ruined it. No, what no, he did no, was take Robert, out onerous no, regulations. No. That's not that's not that's not what was happening, Robert. The cities complain because they did not want to have to submit their housing plans. They all know this is just too much for us. No, too much is housing discrimination, Greg. That's the problem. And so, again, Robert, I get your point. You're conservative. You want to, you wanna, hey, hey, ch pump. You got your pom-poms out for Ben Carson. <laughs> but the reality is they have rolled back civil rights uh, in this administration, including in housing and urban development. Of course. And, and Ben Carson is, again, they're taking their cue from the White House. You have an adult-minded signing, human signing pen in, human, in Donald Trump. And what you really have in the White House is Mick Mulvaney in terms of domestic policy. Look at the evisceration of the HUD budget. The man didn't even fight for his own budget. Let's be very clear. And in fact, and in fact, and in fact, Robert, I'm reading from, this is a headline, December 24th, 2018, Washington Post. Ben Carson's HUD dials back investigations into housing discrimination. Because that money could be better used on abused on actually building houses. I, I don't know why we're pretending that things were great four years, eight years, ten years ago, instead of realizing no, no, those I'm sorry. things need to be I'm reformed. Sorry. No, 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 Robert. No one ever. No, Robert. No one said great. Mm -hmm. But if you are the secretary of HUD and you're dialing back on on this, on, on on the issue of investigating housing discrimination, here we, that took place in 2018, the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. The reality is that housing discrimination still impacts uh, African Americans, still impacts others, and I'm sorry, I don't. It is not changed enough. I am not painting a picture that under Obama, under George W. Bush, under Bill Clinton, under George H. W. Bush, under Ronald Reagan, uh, under Jimmy Carter, under Ford, under Nixon, that somehow public housing was this great thing. But what I'm not going to do is paint this uh, basket photo, this, this art piece <laughs> of how amazing Carson has been doing when I'm sorry, the evidence simply is not there to support your argument. It, Final it, comment, Robert, Lauren, Greg. 
All right, Roland, see, you, you're fancy. You're talking about Basquiat and all these rich people things. I'm a country boy. There's this old saying you can either have eggs. Well, no, no, no. First of all, I said, I, I said Basquiat <laughs> because white folks would have said Picasso, and I'm going to mention uh, an African-American painter. But go right ahead. Well, I'm going I'm to keep, keep it country. There's an old saying you can either have eggs or you can have chickens. So what we're saying is that we want everything to stay intact. We don't want to break any eggs. We don't want to uh, create anything that will disrupt nope. the system. But at That's the same time, we want to reform the system. Ben Carson came in a situation where he was walking into a broken system that's been broken for 50 years and had to fix it. And part of that was destroying what existed to build it back up. The only way to build something new is to take down what didn't work for the last 50 years. Well, why would Ben Carson? Uh, Lauren, one of the one, La Lauren, Lauren, one of the things that uh, Carson did was that the uh, uh, this is according to Washington Post. Another Obama rule that held lenders and landlords liable for policies that led to discrimination, even if none was intended, Lauren Carson rolled that back, too. Go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, well, not only did he roll it back, of course, in the president's budget, there's a massive, massive cut to HUD. You know, one of the magic tricks the conservatives love to perform is this idea that we're making things better by cutting them and making them simple. Yeah, okay. So housing in the United States has always been, um, you know, with regard to redlining and everything else, a, a, a racially, and, and with this president, of course, in his history, a, uh, a race-based situation. So I, I'm not clear on what Robert's talking about. Uh, ben Carson is not an expert in housing. So it was always very strange well. that he was in that position to begin with. And when you cut the department by billions of dollars, it tells people what your priorities are. Uh, Greg, I'm going to read this and I want you to respond. Carson has only used his authority as HUD secretary to scrutinize widespread housing discrimination. Um, moving ahead under public pressure on an investigation against Facebook that was initiated during the Obama administration. Here's the next piece. President Barack Obama's HUD secretaries used the tool known as Secretary Initiated Complaints an average of 10 times per year, while President George W. Bush's second HUD secretary used it an average of five times per year. Carson has only used it once. Oh, that's, not, that's not surprising. I mean, we can go back to the fact that the uh, staff at HUD has been hollowed out. Um, and again, this as Lauren said, he didn't know anything about housing. He didn't know anything apparently about buildings. Because remember when uh, on your show on TV One, that's around the time that he said that the pyramids in Egypt were used to store grain. But at any rate, uh, <laughs> but the beautiful thing about Ben Carson, uh, we're coming up on the, about the year anniversary. I guess it was last April that he proposed tripling the rent on people who have Section 8 and federal housing subsidies. In other words, biting into low-income folk who are already trying to pay for child care and health care. Ben Carson is a human joke as it comes to being a member of anybody's federal cabinet. And anybody trying to argue otherwise just finds himself indefensible. Go back to practicing surgery or write another version of Gifted Hands. But, brother, you need to leave housing alone. Uh, all, all I'm going to do is this. I'm going to recite the facts, not the other stuff. All right, folks, two good things from the Trump administration today, but only after major pushback from activists and the media. Trump overruled Betsy DeVos as education secretary and his budget will now include money for the Special Olympics. <laughs> DeVos cut and defended the cuts. I, I, I don't know what, that was just about the dumbest thing. And on a story we reported on last week, some 4,000 Liberians are in the U.S. as refugees from a brutal civil war that killed a quarter of a million people between 1989 and 2003. They were in danger of being deported at the end of the month. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, among others, opposed this. And today the White House announced a one-year extension of their right to stay in the United States. I, Robert, there's a lot of stuff you can cut. The damn Special Olympics? Look, Betsy DeVos is an idiot. So uh, I think that we didn't make that clear that she's just some rich lady who ended up being housed or being the education secretary, but she doesn't have any damn sense. So part of that w is that the Republicans gave themselves a $1.5 trillion tax cut last year. And now they have to figure out how to pay for it because the deficit has increased by, uh, by almost $2 trillion in two years. And 
putting that money on the back of people in the Special Olympics, on the um, having people in education and special education and uh, the disabled pay for that, I think it's unconscionable. So clearly this was a non-starter. Clearly this thing, these are things that she did not run by people higher up, and that's why Trump had to overrule her, because it was an idiotic decision from, uh, from the moment that she announced it. But this, this, is the mm -hmm. prob this is the problem. And of course, we know Trump has no problem throwing everyone under the bus. The problem is this. Bessie DeVos didn't know there was a cut in that budget. If you look at her questioning, she's sitting there with that same deer in the headlight, fake teeth smile she's had all along. I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic program. Betsy DeVos, like Wilbur Ross in Commerce, who tried to add that census question, got that probably from Stephen Miller in the White House. This is being run out the White House. This is Mick Mulvaney. Donald Trump doesn't know anything about it either. So it was bad PR. Right. He threw DeVos under right. the bus. DeVos didn't know that cut was in there until she showed up for the hearing. Yeah, it's embarrassing watching Bessie DeVos. She probably is singularly the most stupid cabinet <laughs> official in the Trump administration, and that is saying something. Um, and she, you know, she has to, of course, is required to come to Congress to testify, so she can't really hide for very long. But on this one, she clearly, you know, as Dr. Carr just said, she clearly had absolutely no idea what was going on, as usual. Right. And she just creates viral media. That's basically what she does when she testifies. It's like, what dumb thing is she going to say well, we'll that's going to end up on Twitter <laughs> and blow up? And that's basically been her use the entire, this entire administration. Well, we sure, well, well, we sure as hell appreciate it. All right, <laughs> y'all, new black candidate announced for president today, Wayne Messam, the first black mayor of Miramar, Florida. Here's his launch video. I grew up in the place they call the muck. My mother and father came here to the United States from Jamaica. My father was a contract sugarcane cutter, very hard, intense labor with machetes to cut the sugar canes in the hot sun in South Florida. You know, I can see him looking around in these fields, envisioning that his children would be successful one day and they wouldn't have to suffer the way that he suffered. Well, I'm passionate about the American dream because it's not a fictitious thing for me. It's real for me. Went to Florida State on a football scholarship. The legendary coach, Bobby Bowden, and won a national championship there. Started a construction business with my wife. We were recognized by the United States Green Building Council for building the first lead platinum school in the Southeast United States. I became the first African-American mayor of the city of Miramar when I unseated a 16-year incumbent. The city of Myanmar actually was able to beat out China and bring jobs to our city. The problem in America, as I see it, is that we are not addressing these high stake problems that we must deal with today. When you have a senior citizen who can't afford her prescription medicine, Washington is broken. When our scientists are telling us, if we don't make drastic changes today, the quality of our air will be in peril, Washington is broken. Everyday people are graduating from universities with crippling debt, stifling their opportunity for financial mobility. That is what's broken with this country. America belongs to all of us. The promise of America belongs to all of us. That's why I'm going to be running for president, to be your champion. I'm very proud of you. Yes. The same prospects of the American dream that my father was able to achieve. We need to bring that back for every American. <clears throat> All right, first of all, for a lot of people, now here's a piece. The brother, he follows me on, on uh, Twitter. I've, I've actually never heard of him. Uh, I was very surprised to see uh, him announce. But here's the other thing, Lauren, that people, a lot of people don't realize. You've got, I think, 70 or 80 people or more who've actually filed a run for president. Uh, so it's not, I mean, so, so, so what do you make of this announcement? I mean, you know, 140,000 people, uh, mayor of that city. Of course, you got the guy, he hasn't announced he's running for president, uh, but he's uh, the, 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 the Notre Dame mayor. He, now, has he announced or is he still an exploratory? I, like right now, I don't know who the hell is actually running or thinking of running or an exploratory committee. I'm not sure where we are right now. Yeah, Lauren, what do you the think? first time I heard of him was when Jackie sent the show notes. That was basically my <laughs> first thing. But I mean, that that looks pretty cool. It shows you how many people that can get into this this 2020 race and and make a difference. And obviously, the power of social 
media, the democratization of social media, allows people like Beto O'Rourke, for example, to blow up even though he has no substance and get out there and just sort of become viral. So who knows? This guy could be the next Beto O'Rourke, the next Barack Obama, etc. So, I mean, you know, if the guy that's the mayor of South Bend can show up and do as well as he has and, and be on a CNN town hall and do all this other stuff, then this fellow can do the same thing. But you're right. You know, I'm with you. I had never heard of him until today. But that doesn't really mean anything. So good for him. Greg, I agree. I agree with Lauren. And, you know, it's funny. In, in seeing his announcement, he, he said the muck. I immediately thought about <laughs> Tea Cake and Zora Neale Hurston out there with cane and tomatoes and all the stuff they say they grow in the muck in her famous, of course, 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. So when he says he comes from the muck, I ain't mad at him. But like Lauren said, I mean, he's going to South Carolina a couple of times early on. He's going to try to register in this field. Let a thousand flowers bloom and let them sort it out because Donald Trump already has his playbook, fear, racism and everything right. else. So let these folks slug it out. And if this man, certainly if, if uh, the mayor of South Bend can stand on the stage and if a man named Robert Francis O'Rourke can rebrand as Beto and show up <laughs> to be the president of the United States, then certainly this man who at least runs a city, no however small, can throw his hat in the ring. Uh, Robert? Look, he has my vote already since he said he was Jamaican. So, if, <laughs> as, look, if, what do you guys talk about Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who is the mayor of South, uh, South Bend, Indiana. He said during his campaign speeches that he is a uh, uh, Maltese, left-handed, Episcopalian, <laughs> gay, millennial mayor of a small town in the Midwest, and he's he's polling third in the Iowa caucuses. So by all means, my Jamaican brother, run. Like uh, Donald Trump proved in 2016 that when you have a large field like this, when you have 17, 20, 25 candidates, that anybody can pull ahead. Whoever gets those headlines, whoever gets that free media, can win a couple primaries, get the momentum flowing behind them, get the money coming in after that and win. So there's nothing to say that he can't win. People are talking about Stacey Abrams running. Right. The biggest election Stacey Abrams ever won was 26,000 votes right. as a state representative of House District 89 in Georgia. So if she is being talked about as a presidential candidate winning 29,000 votes in the last election she won, then why can't he um, be a presidential candidate representing a city of 150,000 people? Got my support, brother. All right. All right, we certainly appreciate it. All right, for all the folks who are watching YouTube, remember you can also uh, give uh, right there on YouTube while the show is live. So a lot of you have uh, been commenting right now, so please do so. Support Roller Martin Unfiltered. Going to a break. We'll be back in just a moment. Hey, fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. And check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. Press play. You either gonna help run it or they're gonna run it for you. In order to get anything done in this world, we have to work with the system that's there. And you have to have the courage of your convictions. You may despise me, you may not understand my choice, but at least you can respect that I stood in it. If you are outside the mainstream, no one can push you aside any further. Life makes you jaded and it hurts you and it's painful. And we've had a lot of pain in this country. Trump can show up and say anything and they can just go, oh yeah. And the African American community was great to us. They didn't vote. You know, he just called you stupid. Did you hear that? Oh, 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 but he's for us. Really? And they were just regurgitating the things that they had heard on a radio or in the barbershop or something that somebody had told them. They hadn't thought about it. democracy is in danger is because people don't know how to think. I'm done with trying to convince people to try to vote for their, you know, for their for their life. You have to run for your life. I'm going to go try to get people who are open to it and, and, and lead them. I'm done with hope. Fuck hope. Bye. That's good. In the back, in the back, in the back, in the back. In the back. Uh, all right, folks, that, that's an Erica Alexander interview. We're going to live stream tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, after we finish the show. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Uh, it's going to be a great interview. New developments on the Republican power grab in Wisconsin. We told you how the Republican-controlled legislature passed a series of laws in the lame duck session last year to curtail the power of the incoming Democratic governor and attorney general. Well, earlier this week, a state judge declared those laws unconstitutional. Another state judge has agreed, but yesterday, a state appeals court reinstated some of those laws. It's not clear what happens next, but there will be more appeals and court hearings. 
Now, remember how we always say vote in every election, not just the top races. Judges in Wisconsin are elected, which is also why we have to remember to vote. A federal judge ruled late yesterday that Medicaid work requirements undermine the program's mission of providing health care for the needy, dealing a major blow to, the Donald, to Donald Trump. Uh, they're using work requirements as a way to deny care to poor people. I tell y'all, the main don't give a damn about poor people. A U.S. district judge in Washington, D.C. blocked work requirements for low-income people in two states, Arkansas and Kentucky. He found that the state's requirements pose numerous obstacles to getting health care. Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin has threatened to end Kentucky's Medicaid expansion, covering more than 400,000 people if work requirements are ultimately struck down. Bevin is a Republican. In Arkansas, uh, Asa Hutchinson, he's the governor there, he also wants a waiver to enforce those work requirements. And uh, speaking of also not giving a damn about the poor, did y'all see Donald Trump's comments about Puerto Rico where he said no one, no president has done more for the Puerto Rican people than Donald Trump? Y'all, this is delusional. If you are a Puerto Rican anywhere in America, I don't see how in the hell you could vote for this man in 2020. We now know based upon reports that he has made it clear that he wants to deny, <coughs> he wants to deny additional resources to Puerto Rico as a result of a hurricane that, that struck the island last year. This man does not care about Puerto Rico. He's shown it and it's no shock that he's gonna continue to do this. But to say you've done more than anybody else, dude, really? Sit the hell down. Time for another break. Uh, we come back. Uh, more Roller Martin Unfiltered. Defining myself as opposed to being defined by others is one of the most difficult challenges I face. Politician and lawyer Carol Mosley Brown. All right, folks, HBCU Giving Day, our school is Lincoln University uh, in Missouri. It was founded in 1866. They're located in Jefferson City, Missouri. Notable graduates include Lloyd Gaines, Joe Torrey, Oliver Cox, Dorothy Butler Gilliam, and many others. If you want to support Lincoln, go to lincolnu.edu, lincolnu.edu. Calling all HBCU alumni, students, and leaders, enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win $25,000 for your school. Building on their long-term support of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. The winning program will receive a grant of up to $25,000 to implement their proposal. The deadline, folks, is in three days. It's in three days. Go to fgb.life, that's fgb.life, for more information and to apply. And remember, Ford goes further in our community. And we certainly appreciate them being uh, a partner with us at Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm white. I got you, huh? Um, illegally selling water with our permit on my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey, Give me your I'm uncomfortable. All right, y'all, in an effort to encourage Toledo Public School students taking standardized tests this week, the local news team of WTOL in Toledo tried to relate to teens a bit more. Now, I, according to people I know in Toledo, they've tweeted me and they've said that this did not air on the station. But still, they made a total fool of themselves. Look at this, y'all. Good morning, TPS students. It is testing week, and it's time to slay all day. Yeet! Stay woke, be on fleek, and get that Gucci breakfast. Goals! Say bye, Felicia, to that testing stress. Weather's going to be turnt, right, Chris? Yes! Toledo weather going to be V-lit during testing week. A hundo P chance of success. You've got this, kids. Steve, how about that traffic? Are we looking okay? Better than okay. 
we're talking turn, FOMO, won't be an issue. No traffic problems around any TPS schools to keep you from taking those tests. So get a good night's sleep, do your best, in fact, be extra, extra. We here at WTOL are V proud of you. Good, good luck, luck on, on your, your test, test, TPS students. Okay, Greg, you teach college students. Would you even remotely think of doing an a ignorant video like that? I don't have to, brother, because I am actually black and not a white figment of black figment of white imagination. So that was, of course, minstrelsy. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful casebook example to show in a class to deconstruct. But more importantly, as we laugh, we must think about the fact that for many of us in this society, they may even defend that and say, well, they were just trying to be supportive. That's that's the crazy thing, I'm afraid. Yeah, you know what's really There's scary? no way in hell, Lauren. That, <laughs> I mean, there's no way in hell if I was black working at that station, I'd be like, oh, no, we ain't doing this. And see, you know it went through it's multiple people. It had to have gone through at least, you know, the obviously the executive producer. And it goes through them. Like, what were they thinking? <laughs> like, why did they think it was a good idea? And worse, it had to have been rehearsed. So obviously you're doing it once or twice beforehand. And why are they trying to say that, that that wasn't on air? Of course it was on air. That was that was embarrassing. And of course it's embarrassing on YouTube for the ages. I mean, it's not not a good idea. Well, I talked to somebody. Uh, Robert, I, I, I talked to somebody from Toledo who said that that video was supposed to encourage student during students during their testing week. They were trying to be satirical and connect with young people in a way that they communicate. They meant for it to be funny. It was never intended to be serious. That's their explanation for it. But I think the most important thing to talk about is the black dude doing traffic. <laughs> like, as the black dude, you have a responsibility. <laughs> you have it, you have a responsibility <laughs> to explain to everybody else. No. No, abort, abandon ship, <laughs> let's, let's not do this. Like, that is the only reason they have you there to talk them out of things like this, and you failed. You had one job, one job, and you failed at that. So I think we need to have a come to Jesus meeting with him. He's uninvited from all barbecues. He's un uninvited from all cookouts. Uh, he has to turn in his black card along with his key card at the door when he leaves work today. Ron, that face you made should be, Hi, it should be a gift. That face you made should be a gift. Put that on gift. But let's be clear, we're in the minority opinion, because I guarantee you there are young people who would say, why are y'all mad? I'm talking about black kids. <laughs> okay, more crazy as white people. This time in Congress. Republicans have a new strategy to defeat Democrats in 2020, call them socialists. But some of the nuttier Republicans have seized an even bigger lie. Now, one of the absolute dumbest members of Congress <laughs> is Mo Brooks of Alabama and Louis Gohmert of Texas. Two of the most embarrassed, if I was a white man, I would want to take their white men card. Now, what they're doing is they're linking socialism to Nazism because the official name of the Nazi party was the National Socialist Workers Party. Watch this idiot, Louis Gohmert, y'all an actual member of Congress, try to pull this off at a House committee hearing. But the potential is out there for another Hitler, socialist like Hitler, to come along. The awful thing about that, they were the Nazis. It's the Nazis that's terrible, not the socialists. They were fascists. They weren't socialists. They were fascists, the Nazi party. They claimed to be socialists, and they were. <sighs> Robert. Do you really want to stay a conservative after watching that? Remember, I'm a conservative independent, so I'm not associating <laughs> myself with those people. We really need better schools in this country. I, I think it's very important that we teach a actual Amer uh, world history where people understand the difference between fascist, socialist, communist. The reason uh, Hitler came to power by opposing the communists who avowed economic policy was socialism. So the, to say that the Nazis were socialist is antithetical to history. Now, anybody who's read anything beyond a three 
sentence summary of World War II would understand that. Lou Gomer is somebody who I think has to really under really figure out what exactly he's trying to fight against. If you want to uh, have a discussion on government control of economic policy, that's a fine discussion to have. If you want to have a uh, have a discussion on what the marginal tax rate should be for corporations and individuals, that's the conversation to have. But tr to try to conflate Bernie Sanders and AOC with Hitler, I think is a bridge way too far, and it's something where the strange credibility and credulity of any individual listening. Yeah, well, well, Lauren, I it's amazing how at a it's amazing how at APAC uh, all those folks they spend all their time slamming Ilhan o Congresswoman Ilhan o Omar of uh, Minnesota. Republicans love to talk about her, but they truly have some of the absolute dumbest people you have ever seen in their caucus. Now, we, Louis Gomer and Mo Brooks literally make Steve King look like a Rhodes Scholar. Yeah, Mo Brooks is a throwback really to the 1940s and 50s. Um, Louis Gomer is, is just a silly person. Um, I don't know what to say about some of the House Republicans. Uh, they had run on this idea of the Tea Party, which was really nothing more than just let's stop the black guy from doing stuff in the White House. And they've gotten to a point really where without him there, they don't really have a foil anymore to make these arguments. And so, you know, they allow people like uh, uh, AOC to sh show up from the Bronx and really blow them up on their own rhetoric. You know, she can sit and talk about climate change not only, you know, being an issue in New York but in Iowa and really speak to the issues in a more global way. And, and at some point it catches up to you, this sort of, sort of dumb rhetoric, but it's red meat for their base, for their district, for that gerrymandered red district that they come from, so it works on a, in a very narrow way for, for them, but it's going to go out of fashion uh, at some point, and at some point very quickly. Greg? Yeah, I, I hope, Lauren, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I don't see, if past is prelude, I don't see that necess it's necessarily going to happen. Of course, Louis Gohmert is an idiot, but so are the people that vote for him. And when you look at uh, AOC and what she did, as you said, on, on climate change, what she offered uh, in Congress the other day, and rolled back before that to Mike Lee out of Utah, he's a United States senator. Right. Only thing dumber than him are the people that voted for him. But that's their strategy. This isn't a matter of winning arguments. This is a matter of winning elections. And so all you got to do is say socialism, as you said, that base, and then try to hold on to it. And if you look at the gerrymandering cases that were argued at the Supreme Court while we were talking about Jesse Smollett, let's get one thing for sure. They are trying to steal elections, and you hold that base together by playing to their fears. It isn't a matter of brain. It's a matter of heart. And in their hearts, there is a deep intolerance and racism that will have them even have the planet choke on the smoke before they will lose an election. It has nothing to do with being right or wrong or even being intelligent. In fact, stupidity plays better with that base. All right, folks, I want to, um, of course, uh, this also happened today uh, in the uh, college uh, bribery scandal involving all those uh, largely uh, rich white folks. Uh, Rudy Meredith, who was the former soccer coach, the former women's soccer coach at Yale University, a brother, uh, today in federal court in Boston, pleaded guilty to accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in exchange for helping uh, those students get into Yale by being on the soccer team, even though they could not play soccer. Uh, Meredith pleaded guilty to two charges of wire fraud, uh, which each carried maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. Uh, now, he uh, accepted about $860,000 uh, from uh, California uh, admissions, College Admissions Counselor William Rick Singer as part of a scheme to help these rich kids get into schools. And so this is the first uh, guilty plea. Uh, and again, Rudy Meredith is a brother. Uh, again, with a former soccer women's soccer coach at Yale University, uh, and it uh, of course we don't don't have when uh, sentencing actually is uh, he will return to court on June twentieth uh, for sentencing, and so uh, we'll uh, certainly keep y'all uh, up to date on all of that. Uh, all right, folks, we're here in Los Angeles. The 50th NAACP Image Awards will be taking place on Saturday. Uh, so let me give you a sense of what we're going to be doing tomorrow. 
We're going to be actually uh, broadcasting uh, from a local YMCA uh, where uh, McDonald's uh, has a particular uh, initiative. We're going to do some interviews and we'll also be doing our show live from there. Now, tomorrow evening uh, at 7 p.m., first of all, so we're going to have the show tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern. 7 p.m. Eastern, we're going to stream my interview with Erica Alexander. Remember her uh, from Living Single? Fantastic interview. Uh, some powerful, powerful stuff she had to say about the importance of voting uh, and being involved in uh, the issues. And so we're going to talk to her at 7 p.m. Eastern. They're going to come back live. Uh, at around 9 uh, p.m. Eastern, uh, where we're going to be from the red carpet of the NAACP Image Award pre-show. Uh, and so that actually more Image Awards are actually awarded uh, at the pre-show than the actual telecast. And so uh, we're going to be live on tomorrow. Uh, Friday. So again, 6 p.m. Eastern, our normal show. And then, of course, we'll be, reached, we'll be streaming the Erica Alexander interview at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then at 9 p.m. Eastern, we'll be live from the NAACP Image Awards pre-show. Uh, that's tomorrow night in a of course, on Saturday, uh, the Image Awards uh, will be broadcast and we will be live from the red carpet from interviews there as well. And so I don't know if any other black news, uh, any other black uh, media company, website or whatever is going to be out here doing this kind of coverage. But that's why we have Roland Martin Unfiltered, which means why we need you to support Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, so we want you to please uh, go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give goes to support uh, what we do here uh, with this show, traveling around the country, doing interviews, covering the issues that matter to us. And so uh, you can join our Bring the Funk fan club uh, by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You can uh, you can pay via Cash App, PayPal, or Square. If you want to make a monthly donation, you can do that. If you want to do a one-time uh, donation, that's fine as well. We would love uh, to, uh, again, have as many as you as possible. All the folks right now, you're watching us on Periscope, you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube. It doesn't cost you anything, but we also need you to support what we do to make this happen as well. I want to thank, of course, Robert Patillo, Juan Victoria Burke, Greg Carr for being on my panel today. Thank you so very much. Folks, I shall see you tomorrow. And yes, I'm rocking my Houston Astros uh, uh, jersey. Today is the opening day of Major League Baseball. And so, y'all know my Astros going to handle that business. All you Yankees fans, you Red Sox fans, we're going to take care of y'all. How, that's how we do it. Uh, and so, for all the folks here, thank you so very much. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Holla!